It is now my pleasure, if I could have my slides up, to introduce our society's president, Dr. James Stephen Economou. Dr. Economou was born in Evanston, Illinois. His father, Stephen Economou, was a major leader in the Chicago surgical community who clearly had a significant uh, influence on Jim's life. They're illustrated here together when Jim was approximately age 12. So after spending his teenage years in the suburban Chicago uh, area, Jim set off to uh, Johns Hopkins where he received his undergraduate degree in biology and then remained at Johns Hopkins for his MD and PhD, which were awarded in 1980 as part of the accelerated MD-PhD program there. His dissertation was entitled Physical, Chemical, and Biologic Properties of Lymphocyte Activating Factor. Jim gave me this picture of his graduating class. I'm not entirely sure why, because it took me about two weeks to try and figure out which one of these heads was him, which I believe is somewhere way up here in the back row, but I think he sent it to me to demonstrate that he was able to avoid the tendency of those times for both disco hair and large bushy mustaches, neither of which he had. So he then moved west. He did his internship and his junior residency at UCLA and completed his surgical training at UCSF. He joined the faculty at UCLA in 1986 and in a remarkably short time period of eight years was professor of surgery and the incumbent of the Louis Beaumont Chair in Surgery. His academic accomplishments are numerous. He is the author of 116 peer-reviewed publications. He is the deputy editor of the Journal of the American College of Surgeons and he's on numerous editorial boards, some of which such as cancer gene therapy, are not normally inhabited by surgical editorialists. He has chaired the Experimental Therapeutics Study Section 2 of the NIH and also chaired the Cancer Manpower and Training Subcommittee at the NIH. He received his first NCI grant in 1988. He has had continuous funding since that time, including multiple R01s, a program project grant, and T32 training grants in surgical oncology, tumor immunology, and gene medicine. I suspect if you were to ask Jim which of the accomplishments on this slide he was most proud of, he would tell you it's the 25 research fellows that he have trained, many of whom are now leaders in our society and hold prominent academic positions. Now, I must confess that as part of this talk, I was trying to dig up a little dirt on Jim, so I contacted some of his former research fellows who said, well, you know, he really plays things pretty close to the vest. We don't have a lot of dirt we can share with you, which must mean they're still afraid of him all these years later. But what they did tell me was that they joined his laboratory because his ideas were better more innovative and interesting than any other laboratory they could find, I think, a true tribute to his academic career. He has received multiple awards, including the 12th American College of Surgeons Scholarship. From 1989 to 92, he was the Dorothy and Leonard Strauss Scholar of the UCLA School of Medicine, named by the dean. And in 2006, he received the James Ewing Medal of Our Society. He doesn't have a lot to do. He's been the director of the Surgical Oncology Fellowship at UCLA since 1991, the chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology since 2000, professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics since 2000, and served as the deputy director of the Cancer Center from 2002 to 2010. He was also named professor of molecular and medical pharmacology in 2007. Now, those of you who recognize this picture as center court at the Pauley Pavilion at UCLA might be forgiven for thinking that this is a reunion photograph of one of the great basketball teams of UCLA in the past. However, I will point out to you that there are way too many short white guys in this picture for that to be what it is. And in fact, 
It is a picture of the chancellor and his vice chancellors. And in 2010, Jim was named vice chancellor for research in the UCLA system, true recognition of his contributions there. So while there can be no doubt that Jim is academically accomplished, as the presidents of this society generally are, I think we'd all like to know what is he really like. Now, as the president-elect of the society, you have to spend a lot of time interacting with the president, and I never really knew Jim very well until the past year or two. And you can see that there are some people who start out in life exactly what they end up with as adults. And if you look at little Jim here compared to current Jim and look at the expression on his face, I think you'll understand that. Now, many times when I was talking away to Jim, I had no idea what he was thinking. What I hoped he was thinking was this, but unfortunately, what I suspect he was thinking was what's illustrated here. Jim is a devoted family man. He's shown here with his wife, Denise, who is an oncology nurse who does research in survivorship and palliative care. And their three sons, the fact that this is an older picture is perhaps best described by the fact that uh, their oldest son, uh, Stephen, is now in law school. Their younger two sons are now in college. But I will point out in this picture, you see something that is characteristic of all the economy family pictures that I've looked at, namely, Denise looks really happy, Jim looks slightly bemused, and the sons, depending on their age, if they're little, look happy to be with mom and dad, and if they're older, they're starting to look cool. So one of Jim's main activities has been with the scouts. He has been active across the spectrum of scouting from the Cub Scouts through to the Boy Scouts. Here he is shown probably at a younger age because he has this enormous pack on his back. He's clearly walking up a hill, and he's nonetheless smiling. Fast forward a few years, and we now see him on the top of the hill with his youngest son, George, who's clearly having a great time. I'm not sure that Jim looks like he's quite so sure about that, but he did make it to the top of the hill. Here is the family more recently on a ski trip, and again, you can see that Denise is smiling. The boys aren't so sure. I think they were getting ready to push Jim down the hill at this particular point in time. Now, I think when Jim became the president of the uh, SSO, he initially found it relatively stressful. This is a picture of him on the morning after his first executive council meeting. However, as one would expect for a man of his accomplishments, he rapidly adapted to this. And recently, my spy camera discovered him preparing for his presidential address here. And you can see by the smile on his face shown up close that he has things firmly under control. So at this point in time, I think the only thing left to say about our president before we hear his address on cancer surgery at the Los Angeles Zoo is Jim, both personally and on behalf of our entire society. I'd like to thank you for your leadership during this uh, exciting year of transition and wish you the joy of the day. Our president, Dr. Economu. So I want to begin my presidential address by thanking two remarkable surgical leaders, uh, Monica Morrow, who will succeed me as president, and Mitch Posner, who was my immediate predecessor. Many of you already know what I learned over the last year. Monica is hardworking, highly organized, an articulate and purposeful leader, and a preeminent expert in breast diseases. She undertook some of the most challenging tasks over the last year. Many of the enhancements that our society membership will enjoy, and which I'll describe to you on Saturday afternoon at our business meeting, can be directly attributed to her initiative. Monica, I'm deeply grateful to you for your service as president-elect, and the society has much to look forward to during your presidency. 
Monica, I will be sending to you this book from my father's library. It is an 1845 edition of Sir Astley Cooper's Anatomy and Diseases of the Breast. I did not know Mitch Posner at all before I became vice president. As I indicated to you last year when I introduced him to you as president, Mitch is the real deal. He is hardworking, a superior clinical surgeon and investigator, a great leader, and a fundamentally decent person. But many of you right now who know Mitch as well as I do, and I see some of you whispering to each other, you're asking yourselves, what sort of book am I going to give to Mitch? So the only thing Mitch has to read are two words, Yogi Berra, on this signed baseball. Mitch is a lifelong Yankee fan, and I thought it was especially appropriate to give him a baseball signed by this Hall of Fame Yankee catcher. Because in many respects, Mitch and Yogi are very much alike. You can fill a small book with some of Yogi Berra's sayings. My favorite is this, when you come to a fork in the road, take it which I think was very reminiscent of the title of Mitch's presidential address last year. It's not the destination, it's the journey. So Monica and Mitch, it's been a great privilege to get to know you better and to serve in between your respective presidencies. I would like to express to the membership of our Society of Surgical Oncology how deeply honored I've been to serve as your 65th president. This was an undeserved and unexpected privilege. It's been an exciting year with the approval of board certification and a complete overhaul of the society infrastructure and educational products. On Saturday afternoon at our business meeting, I'll give you an overview of all the activities in which we've been engaged in a short report entitled, A Society in Transition. It'll also give me the opportunity to properly thank Eileen Widmer and her staff at the SSO headquarters for their absolutely outstanding support of our society. This is my uh, loving and supportive uh, family, my wife Denise, who's uh, here at the meeting, and my three sons, Peter, George, and Stephen. They're a continual source of uh, pride in my life. I'm indebted to uh, many individuals throughout my career, and I feel obligated to quickly acknowledge them. All were role models. Some became mentors. A role model is a person regarded as a good example to follow, whose behavior and quality is worth adopting. They don't have to be mentors, although the benefits are greater if they are but they're persons who have admirable qualities that are worthy of acquiring. Six individuals at Hopkins had an important impact early in my career. The senior vascular transplant surgeon, Mel Williams, in whose laboratory I first worked, Mac Holmes and Mike Zinner, who were senior residents on whose services I was assigned as a medical student, John Cameron, Saul Roseman, who was the chair of biology at Hopkins, and my PhD advisor, Yun Shin. At UCSF, where I completed my training, I had the privilege of working with the Devonies, Cliff and Karen, Paul Ebert, who was chair at the time, Nick Feduska, Maurice Galante, David Hone, who was trained by my father and later trained me, Frank Lewis, Carlos Pellegrini, Bill Schechter, Don Trunke, Larry Way. This was a pantheon of American academic surgery. At UCLA, Dr. Longmire, again Mike Zinner and Mac Holmes, now two outstanding chairs of our department. Two basic science colleagues, Judy Gass and Owen Whitting, from whom I learned a great deal. And especially my senior colleague in surgical oncology, Fred Alber, one of the most admired and respected members of the UCLA faculty. 
There are four leaders in our society who continually played influential roles in my career. Tim Eberlein, Rafe Pollack, also trained by my father, Charles Balch, and Bill Kantz. For some reason, these four individuals who have become good friends always seem to be working in the background to support my career. It never hurts if a preeminent role model and mentor is apparent. My father was a past member of the society, a surgical educator and scientist, and a surgeon's surgeon. These are my parents, Stephen and Catherine Economo, their three children, and 12 successful grandchildren. <clears throat> In 2006, I had the privilege of receiving the James Ewing Medal from this society and delivering this lecture, during which I spent 45 minutes speaking about molecular immunology and signaling pathways. I decided for my presidential address that I would not torture you a second time. I also read past presidential addresses, all of them thoughtful and visionary expositions, and I frankly felt there was not much more I could add. Instead, I want to describe to you some rewarding experiences I've had as one of the founding members of the Los Angeles Zoo Medical Advisory Board. Throughout my career, I've conducted animal research with the goal of developing new therapies that would change the care of patients. These have all been complex cell and gene-based therapies. But I've had the opportunity over the last 15 years to work with a group of outstanding zoo veterinarians and animal curators using knowledge of human disease biology and the implementation of modern technology to help animals. I've listed some of my zoo colleagues here. So this morning, I'm going to show you three video clips of large animal operations in which uh, we participated. The first operation was on Caesar, a male silverback lowlands gorilla who had a recurrent pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid gland. Miniac, a purebred Borneo orangutan with recurrent infected laryngeal air sac. Not exactly a cancer, uh, but an interesting and life-saving operation. And finally, and most recently, an operation performed on Randa, a single-horned Indian white rhinoceros with recurrent multifocal squamous cancer of the horn. In the late 1990s, I received a phone call from one of the veterinarians at the LA Zoo about one of their gorillas named Caesar. This is a picture of Caesar taken in 1977. He was the first gorilla delivered by cesarean section, thus his name. Caesar was the pride and joy of the LA Zoo and had a huge fan club. He had developed a mass in his left parotid, which had been excisionally biopsied in the past found to be a pleomorphic adenoma. Now the tumor had recurred and they asked us uh, for help. This is the entrance to the Los Angeles Zoo, which is located in Griffith Park. It has a uh, botanical garden. There are 1,100 animals housed here. We were using the uh, veterinary hospital in the um, zoo complex that had been built in 1966. This is the small operating room there, and it's being uh, readied for surgery. This is Dr. Charles Sedgwick. He's now retired, but he was one of the preeminent zoo veterinarians in the US. This is how most zoo operations start, <laughs> with this initial sedation uh, provided with this uh, dart gun. Here we're driving down to the uh, zoo complex. That's my sister Stacy in the middle there in the uh, blue shirt. She's a UCLA trained head and neck surgeon. That's a smaller gorilla, that's not uh, Caesar. As you can see, they're getting ready to uh, go back into the pen and Charles Sedgwick uh, has darted uh, Caesar and they're very carefully entering the enclosure. Caesar weighed um, over 600 pounds.
The woman in the back with the um, uh, blonde hair is Dr. Cynthia Stringfield, who, along with uh, Dr. Sedgwick, were the uh, senior veterinarians. There you see her uh, carrying Caesar to the uh, gurney. Here they're moving a Caesar to a uh, to the back of a pickup truck to take it down to the hospital. After a short truck ride, we arrived at the hospital. They're moving him onto the gurney. The Medical Advisory Board uh, meets annually, but they call us uh, on an ad hoc basis. And they're a group of uh, specialists who um, can be called in to help them with uh, echocardiography appendicitis in a chimpanzee. Here we're doing the preoperative examination with my sister Stacy. I had to bring her along because she actually uh, knows how to do this operation. This is a Charles Sedgwick um, getting ready to intubate Caesar. These zoo veterinarians provide um, a general anesthetic to a wide range of species. They've successfully used a general anesthetic in 156 uh, mammals, 45 birds, and three reptiles. Here we're moving into the operating room. It's kind of a small room. Had to kind of figure out how to uh, how to position the table. It's really a magnificent uh, animal. Caesar's a Western Lowlands gorilla. They're found in the Cameroon and Congo. They're slightly smaller than the mountain gorillas. They're vegetarians. They eat about 20 pounds of food a day. You know, they just published the, um, the genome sequence for gorillas. Next to chimpanzees, they're our next uh, closest relative. You can appreciate the um, the size of the tumor from this examination. Believe it or not, uh, we found a gorilla anatomy book published in 1950 in the UCLA Medical Library. The uh, anatomy is identical, except, uh, as you can imagine, a lot larger. I never operated with my father, so operating with my sister, I think, was the next best thing. Here she's letting me bovi uh, in between her clamp. <laughs> we spent a little time trying to find the main trunk of the facial nerve. It's actually three inches deep to the skin. We realized this was hanging off the lower portion of the parotid. So 
we actually spent more time identifying and sparing the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. As in humans, um, facial expression is important in um, non-human primates. Kind of a big cavity, so we sewed in a couple of uh, Penrose drains with uh, Chromic. I'm not sure what I was thinking, uh, putting this dressing on a 600-pound gorilla. <laughs> Just a beautiful animal. Here we're taking um, a Caesar back to his pen. The cages that they had up at the hospital at that time were not um, strong enough to house a gorilla. He woke up a few hours later. He took off the dressing. He pulled off the drains and ate them. <laughs> and he chugged down two liters of Gatorade, and he was fine. This is a video taken six years later. You can see he has good um, symmetrical facial movement. Just a little bit of a pucker where one of the drains uh, exited. Caesar was the pride and joy of the LA Zoo, and for months afterwards, Stacy and I received small gifts from various zoo patrons. He died a number of years later at another zoo of a viral infection. He was being housed there while they were building a, um, a new gorilla enclosure. In 2003, we were asked to help with Miniac, an orangutan who was slowly dying from an infected laryngeal air sac that was refractory to drainage and antibiotics. By then, the zoo had built a brand new modern hospital. This hospital is 33,000 square feet with an intensive care unit, an operating room, research laboratories, as well as offices for the zoo veterinarians and staff. They provide over 800 medical interventions to the zoo animals every year. The smallest animal they've treated is a poison arrow frog weighing 0 0.2 grams. The largest was Billy the Elephant, who weighs 13,000 pounds. You've seen the OR case list at our uh, hospitals. This is what you'll find at the zoo. Lion, howler monkey, tamarind, elephant, a tree boa. That's Leah Greer, one of the veterinarians, and you can guess if this is the start of the operation. 
She's anesthetizing a maniac. There he is in the corner after the pre-op sedation. Orangutans are arboreal. They're the largest uh, animals that uh, live in the trees. These primates have laryngeal air sacs on their neck and chest, which can be filled with air through slits exiting the larynx. They fill these air sacs and use them as resonating chambers to uh, bellow in the jungle. But if they get infected, it basically ends up as a bag of pus and they can get recurrent aspiration pneumonia. And it was difficult to treat with antibiotics and drainage if they, if they become large and extensive. So what we felt we needed to do was to excise the mucosal lining of this ex extensive air sac and tie off these slits to the larynx. They try to intubate um, Miniac from a variety of positions. There she is, my sister Stacy, that head and neck surgeon, sister of mine, intubating this uh, orangutan with the help of Leah Greer, the old fashioned way. Here we're coming out of the pen. The fellow in the green scrubs there is Wayne Hofstetter. Wayne's a thoracic surgeon. He was then on our faculty. He's now at, uh, he's now at Anderson. We knew this was going to be a long operation, so we asked if he could uh, join the team. You can see this is a much larger operation than we had before. This had been uh, drained previously, so we just opened up the fistula. You get a, an initial appreciation of the size of this uh, laryngeal air sac. Here my sister's allowing me to hold the clamp while she bogies in between. This was an extensive air sac in this older animal extending over the, pector over the pectorals into both axillae. This operation took us a couple of hours and we did it in shifts. Miniac was the only pure Borneo orangutan in the zoo. They had Sumatran orangutans, but they wanted him to breed with females, but he was too sick. Here we're peeling away the mucosa and all these interstices.
So here are the two communications with the larynx, which have been divided and ligated. This accepted about four liters of uh, saline irrigation. We used a lot of chromic to tack down the cavity. We left a small communication for it to drain, but we didn't put Penrose drains in this time. Just checking, checking the endotracheal tube. You can see the size of those uh, incisors, which are quite sharp. We're moving back to the pen, which also serves as a recovery room. doing a little bit of suctioning. But um, extubating an orangutan requires careful timing. You need to stay near the door. Just when he's awake, they slipped out the tube. You can see he wanted a little bit of privacy, so he just crawled under the bench there. I came back the next day for a post-op visit. He's here with his uh, curator. She's giving him some nebulizer treatments, a little water from a squirt bottle, and some grapes. Here are his girlfriends, Eloise and Rosie. They're waiting for him to get out of the hospital. He did go on to successfully breed and sire a, a, a young, pure Borneo orangutan. A couple weeks ago, we went back to visit Minyak. As usual, he was up there in his hammock uh, taking a nap. Almost exactly two years ago, we had one of our medical advisory board meetings at the zoo, and they presented a, the case of Randa, a female single-horned white rhinoceros who had multiply recurrent squamous cancers of the horn. She had undergone a number of procedures, 
where the tumor was chiseled off and within months it would recur someplace else on the horn. This was just after the SSO meeting we had in Phoenix where we had some papers on intraoperative radiation therapy. I told them what Randa needed was to have a complete resection of the horn followed by intraoperative radiation therapy. That was easy to say. I called up uh, Mike Steinberg, who's the chair of radiation oncology, and I told him I had a patient who needed intraoperative radiation therapy, and he asked that I send the patient over to his clinic. I also called my sister Stacy again, and I said, Stacy, the zoo needs us. We need to do a rhinoplasty. <laughs> so Mike Steinberg was able to convince the company that manufactured a portable intraoperative electron beam radiation device to ship the crate with its equipment and to send several of their technicians to help with the Randa surgery. Here's the plain x-ray showing the nasal sinus and horn just above it. Our principal concern was making certain we didn't get into the sinus while we were resecting the horn and leave enough at the base that would tolerate two sessions of electron beam radiation. Here was the preoperative uh, planning uh, the uh, preoperative uh, conference. Randa weighs 6,000 pounds, and after she was sedated, it's important that she was positioned with sufficient padding so that she wouldn't be lying on her uh, extremities and injuring the motor nerves. Thus, the, the need for a, um, a forklift. Here we're prepping the operative site. Indian white rhinos are endangered. Uh, they live almost exclusively in the grasslands and forests in the Himalayan foothills of Nepal in northeast India. Here the goal of the first operation was to take off the bulk of the horn and give the first treatment of radiation. The horn's being scored with an electric saw. We got a sense of the depth by introducing the number of probes. Here you can see a better view of the um, horn with that cauliflower um, squamous cancer. Here's the result of the uh, first surgery. We want to keep the anesthesia time down to a minimum. There's Mike Steinberg in the light blue uh, shirt. He's working with one of the radiation physicists, cutting out the lead shield. Here it's being um, applied to the horn. They delivered 17 gray to surface. These animals can injure themselves when they wake up, thus they had to put them back in the sling and kind of protect them. 
We came back two, or two weeks later to resect the rest of the horn and deliver the second dose. That's the endotracheal tube. You'll get a little better view of the intubation um, for the second procedure. You see that two by six? That's, the, that's their laryngoscope. And that's Leah Greer, who's going to do this intubation. I forgot the tidal volume of a rhinoceros. We obviously didn't have the luxury of, of bringing this animal up to the um, hospital, so we had to do it in the, um, in the yard just outside the pen. That's a Curtis Eng, the senior zoo veterinarian. This has to be the this has to be the best job if you're a if you're a vet. I didn't want to use the electric saw, so I went to Home Depot and I bought a couple of saws. This is one of those pruning saws, it didn't really work very well. I also had a fine-toothed, flexible carpentry saw, which worked very well. Just oozes a little bit, requires a little bit of touch up uh, cautery. She's getting set up for her second dose of radiation. Here's Randa. She's the sweetest 6,000 pound Labrador retriever. Her favorite food are cantaloupe. You can see it's beginning to granulate.
I had to show you Randa's roommate. His name is Jabba. We went to see Randa a couple of weeks ago. She's almost two years out. She's doing very well. This tumor had recurred several times on her horn. And we're very pleased with the outcome. I've been a faculty member at UCLA for 26 years. I want to express my appreciation to a Chancellor Block who invited me two years ago after a year-long national search to join his leadership team as Vice Chancellor for Research. And he's been generous in allowing me to maintain a referral-based practice in surgical oncology, an NCI-funded research laboratory, and to continue with classroom teaching. This has been an exciting opportunity for me to build research engines at our comprehensive research university, variously ranked anywhere between ninth and twelfth in the world, with 4,000 full-time faculty, 40,000 students, and $1 billion in research support. But the most exciting privilege I've had in my career has been to serve as your 65th president. Thank you.